Well, welcome back to Dragon Punch. My name is Gary Gregg, and I'm reading from my novel, The Sporan, um, which takes place in Scotland and America. In the last episode, we just got into a couple of chapters. We got to page 22 uh, last time. And what happened was, if you might remember, Jacob Boyd saw a mysterious stranger, let's say, a red beard, um, shaggy looking guy, uh, outside the science window, and they seemed to be looking at him. And then he walked away. It seemed very strange. And Jacob also got a package from his father. His father is on a business trip to Scotland, and he is in the medieval town of St. Andrews. You should Google, look some pictures of St. Andrews, particularly Rules Tower, which is gonna come up in a little little while here. Uh, but it's a really cool, really cool old medieval place. And if you like golf, or you know anybody that likes golf, they all know St. Andrews is the home of golf. It's a sacred place for, for golfers. But Jacob's dad is on a business trip, and he sends in this package, and the package has something that very clearly, Jacob wants everybody to know, is not a purse. Um, but it's actually called a sporin, and um, and that's the name of the book, the sporin. So it's going to be pretty important, uh, obviously. And a sporin is, of course, a, a kind of a purse, a kind of a, a leather pouch that uh, Scotsmen wear on the front of their uh, front of their body when they are uh, on a belt, when they're wearing a kilt, because kilts don't have pockets in them, so they need they need to have uh, they need to have some place to put things. So. All right, we are on the next chapter, which is called Mousetrap. Jacob would blame his little sister for stealing his baseball, but he had none. He would blame an older brother playing tricks on him, but being an only child, he couldn't do that either. What could have happened to my baseball, he wondered. Ah, if you remember, actually what happened right at the end of the last chapter was Jacob put his baseball in his sporin, the first night he got it, went to bed. When he woke up in the morning, the baseball was gone. As usual, he was running late for the bus and had just enough time to dress and get out the door as his mother, like a walking alarm clock, would forcefully intone, Let's go, Jacob! Perhaps you've heard that from your mother a time or two. Every three minutes until he appeared on the stairs. Finding the ball would have to wait until after school. He didn't mention the missing ball to anyone at school. After all, there was a good chance he just misplaced it or something. He had lost things before, and he was relatively sure regulation size and weight baseballs don't just disappear. Maybe I don't really, maybe I didn't really put it in the sport after all. He let himself at least consider the possibility. On the bus that afternoon, Jacob asked Will and Jenny to meet him at his house at 3.30. They agreed, and at the appointed time, two bikes approached 10 Long Branch Drive from different directions and raced the last few yards up the driveway. Seeing them coming, Jacob leaned out his bedroom window and yelled down to his friends, I'm up here. Just come on in. Jenny stepped uh, first into Jacob's room and found him sprawled on the floor, pushing the dust around under his bed. He was obviously was looking for something. What are you searching for? Jenny asked. The muffled answer that came from under the bed was unintelligible. Will gave a solid kick to Jacob's foot as he stepped over him and sat down in the chair. Dust covered and sneezing, Jacob sat up, cross-legged. I'm hunting for a baseball, Jacob said matter-of-factly. Okay, but you have other baseballs in your garage, don't you? Asked Jenny, anxious to get on with doing something more interesting than searching for a lost baseball. Just help me look. It's a McGregor regulation size and weight. Jenny, you check down the hallway and in the hall closet while Will and I look in here. What's so special about the ball, Jacob? Asked Will. Jenny paused at the door to listen to the answer. Probably nothing, but somehow it seems to have disappeared. And unless you... Jenny, Jenny cut himself short, or cut Jacob short. Unless we want to get into more trouble by following you or another crazy adventure, 
like last month when you had us believing Mrs. James was somehow keeping a man-eating piranha in her koi pond. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, just help me look for it, please, Jacob replied to Jenny. The team searched for more than an hour before Jacob finally gave up and called Jenny and Will together on his bed. Lying the sporin in the middle of the bed, he looked each of them in the eye with a seriousness that he had been never that they had never seen before. Oh no, not again. Jenny and Will said simultaneously, because they had seen that look before. The musty smell of old leather made him both curl their nose as they braced themselves. Let me start that again. The musty smell of old leather made them both curl their nose as they braced themselves for what tall tale was to come next from their friend who seemed to always be thinking of tall tales to tell. Last night, Jacob began, I took my baseball from my jacket pocket since I didn't want to take it to school. He recounted how his baseball had somehow then disappeared during the night while no one was in the house except him and his mother. Now let's think reasonably about this, said Jenny, who was always trying to be reasonable about everything. What could have happened to the ball? You either didn't put it in, its, in this little purse last night, or your mother is playing a trick on you. It's not a purse, Jacob scolded her. Or, Will interjected, maybe you were sleepwalking last night, thought you were at the ball field, opened the window, and fired it out into the night. Realizing the ball would still be on the lawn, if that were the case, all three rushed to the window to look. No speck of white on the green lawn. Nothing. Maybe it landed in the in the back of the of a pickup truck that might have been passing by and now is somewhere like Montana or Utah or somewhere else, Will hypothesized, attempting to salvage his theory. Raising his eyebrows, Jacob offered, or maybe this is some magical sporin that sends all things in its pouch to some other dimension where someone may be wondering right this very minute what a McGregor regulation size and weight might be. Let's come back to reality now, Batman, Jenny said as she, she walked across the floor and picked up the lump of leather and hair that was sitting on the bed. What we need is a plan to come up with a reasonable solution to this mysterious disappearance, she offered. The three would be detect detectives. The three would be detectives, sat and thought and puzzled until Will finally came up with the greatest possible plan any of them could have imagined. Okay, now he started. The way I see it, either you are sleepwalking or your mom is playing a trick on you, right? He asked. Go on, said Jacob, wondering where he was going with this line of unmagical reasoning. What we need, then, is a trap, Will continued. A trap that will either catch you when you are sleepwalking or will catch your mother when she sneaks into your room tonight to continue her dastardly plan. Okay, so what kind of trap could we set? Asked Jenny. With a tinge of sarcasm, she continued, Tin cans around the door, maybe? How about a bucket of water balanced on top of the coat rack? How about putting a slimy dead fish in the pouch and then just listening for the scream? Or maybe some worms and dirt? A mousetrap, Will interrupted. Very proud of his developing plan. Whoever reaches into the pouch will get their fingers caught in the trap and will give out a loud yell. If it's your mother, she will wake you up with her yelp and you will have her. If it's you, the snap of the trap will wake you up and the mystery will be solved. Easy for you to say, said Jacob, holding up his fingers and adding, remember, these are my fingers, not yours. They're going to get smashed. But none of them 
could think of another plan that was rem remotely as good, so they headed to the basement to search for a mousetrap. Where are you guys going? Mrs. Boyd asked as they headed toward the door. Uh, just downstairs to look for some stuff, Mom, Jacob answered as he turned the knob and led his friends into their basement. The three searched for half an hour until finally they came across what they thought looked like a drawer of uh, an old, just an old dresser drawer. They'd been holding junk rather than clothes for years, and Mr. Boyd always said that anyone who looked long enough would find whatever they looked for in the junk that it contained. That night, after math homework and a bit of reading in Mystical Beasts and Magical Feasts, Jacob worked to set the trap. He smashed and throbs and thrives. Start. A few smashed and throbbing fingers later, and he had finally figured out how to make it work and slipped the set trap into the sporin, which was hanging on the coat rack in the exact place it had been the night before. He went to sleep that night, hoping he hadn't been the one who stole the ball. He thought of sleepwalking in the night, in the dead of night, and it really freaked him out. He didn't awaken in the night and heard not a thing until precisely 6.15 a.m. the next morning. When the door creaked open, his mom said, Time to get up, bud. He sprang up immediately and was disappointed to realize that nothing had happened in the night. Oh, well, he thought to himself, Maybe I didn't put the ball in the sport after all the other night. Just the same. He looked his mother's fingers over just a bit and then exchanged, as they exchanged places in the bathroom down the hall, but saw no sign that they may have been snapped in the night. He dressed and picked up his coat off the coat rack and fingered the hairy tassel on the spore and hanging next to it. Yeah, better unset that trap before I forget it's in there and get my fingers ripped off when I get home tonight, he thought. Taking a pencil from his desk, he slowly lifted the flap and stuck in a yellow number two and swished the eraser around inside. Nothing happened. No snap. No bang. No jump at the pouch. There was nothing. Slowly lifting the flap and peeking in, his heart leapt in his throat. The sporin was empty. <clears throat> A loud, let's go, Jacob, coming from down the stairs, snapped him out of the shock that the nothingness in the pouch had caused. His mind was preoccupied by the latest disappearance in his room as he flew down the stairs and out the door. Not paying attention to what he was doing, his foot caught the bottom step as he, as he came off the porch. His feet held back, but his top kept going. His arms flew wildly at his sides, trying to regain control until he found himself 15 feet later, later laying in the dewy grass of his front yard, jumping quickly to his feet and looking around to make sure no one had seen. He pulled his backpack down off his head where it had ended up from the fall and limped slowly to the end of the drive to await the bus. Wow. <clears throat> now we have two mysteries. A baseball missing and a mousetrap. Whatever happened to it, wherever it went, I feel sorry for whoever got it. So let's leave today's reading right there. The next reading is called The Blood Red Ball. Again, if you want a copy of the Sparring, it's available on Amazon.com. Uh, regardless of that, we're going to keep reading. We're going to keep reading it right here. So stay here for the next episode. Subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Share it with your, your friends. Write me a note. Tell me what you think. I look forward to hearing from you. And until then... 
Think about what happened to those fingers out there somewhere in the world that may have got hold of that mousetrap. Mysteries will be solved soon. Talk to you soon. Bye.